Welcome to the Early Diversity Internship Program Situational Judgment Questionnaire Webinar. My name is Orisa Kobe, and I will be hosting uh, the webinar, uh, today's uh, webinar. So what to expect from the webinar? Uh, we'll go through an understanding of the application stages, understanding the civil service competency framework, what the civil service is looking for in the situational judgment test, and an opportunity to practice the test um, as well, and followed by key dates, which is the key deadline dates. First of all, before attempting to do the test or take the situation judgment test, it's important to, the first thing to take note of is understanding the civil service competency framework. Again, this might be a new uh, terminology um, for, for yourselves. However, it's something that I'm going to go through more of to actually understand what a competency framework is and why is a competency framework important. Every employer has a set, a, a set of competencies or behavioral capabilities which they use to assess um, new recruits as well as measure performance of existing, uh, existing staff members, existing employees within the organization. And it also uses to make decisions on progression within the organization. So what is a competency? Competencies are the skills, knowledge, and behaviors that lead to successful performance. The competency framework sets out how the civil service want people, i.e. the civil servants, to work. This is used to measure or used to recruit new uh, talent, used to measure performance, and used as a developmental discussions and for decisions about progression. The reason why competencies are important because like every, like, uh, every family, I use the analogy of a family, you know, you may have friends who you have similarities or things in common with you, babe, in a similar way, you have similar interests. However, you, also, you may also notice that they do things differently from the way you do things at home. So like organizations, although they may have or be in the same sector or do, do similar, have similar operations, they have a set of competencies that really guide how they want people to behave and guide how they want things to be done within the organization. It's as a way to get to actually work in a harmonious, effective way and ensuring that people deliver, um, deliver services mm -hmm. on time as expected. So this is why... So with the civil service, every stage of application is set against the civil service competencies, which we will go through in the next slide. And this is just to, this is why it's important to, to um, understand the competencies before attempting to take the test. Because normally the reason why people tend to be unsuccessful when it comes to any form of application is because one of the main reasons are because they haven't taken that time to actually understand what the organization is looking for which then makes it challenging to actually know how to effectively answer or respond to a question. So this is why understanding the competencies before taking the test is absolutely vital and necessary. So what is the civil service looking for? So here are the list of the civil service competencies and what they are looking for within every applicant who apply to be on the Early Diversity Internship Programme, the Summer Diversity Internship Programme, and the fast stream program. So these competencies are broken into three areas, namely setting directions, which looks focused on strategy and being strategic. And the second is known as engaging people, looking at collaborating with, uh, with employees, being a team player, and also building the capability for all meaning, looking at how you develop yourself and develop others in and around the organization. And lastly, looking at delivering results. So again, looking at how people are able to, you know, manage their work effectively, you know, ensuring that they can still maintain a good quality of service in respect where um, delivering a good quality service under a high pressure environment and also delivering value for money. So these competencies shape how, what the civil service believes that by employees adopting or having, adopting these competencies, they will be able to you know, perform to their daily task effectively. And this is why that whoever they bring in, they measure to see how people fare against these competencies, which should then determine 
whether they are a right fit for the organization or not. Just one thing to highlight on the competencies, most people tend to think that the reasons why they fail or don't succeed with applications is because they're not good enough. However, what I have discovered uh, during my time working with uh, various uh, candidates and uh, applicants, what I have discovered that the reason isn't because people aren't good enough, it's simply because there is a either a lack of understanding or lack of awareness of what the organization is looking for, i.e. the values and so on and so forth. So I'm gonna go through what the competencies are. So as I mentioned earlier, the competency supports the civil service reform plan and performance management. It sets up how they want people to work in the civil service. It puts the civil service values of honesty, integrity, impartiality and objectivity at the heart of everything that the civil servants do. And in a huge way, in a huge range of jobs across the country and overseas, one thing that they have in common is that the civil servants are here to support the elected government, providing advice to help shape its policies, ensuring seamless and practical implementation in line with these policies. Competencies are the skills, as I mentioned earlier, are skills, knowledge, and behaviors that lead to successful performance. And the framework outlines 10 competencies, which are grouped into the three areas, which I've mentioned also. So the first competency is seeing the bigger picture or seeing the big picture. What, this, what, does, what does the civil service mean when it says seeing the big picture? In the context of the civil service, seeing the big picture simply means having an in-depth understanding and knowledge of how your role fits with and supports organizational objectives and the wider public needs and national interests. For all staff, it is about focusing their contribution on the activities which will meet the civil service goals and deliver the greatest value. In essence, it's looking at how, you know, like a body, the body has many different parts, has an arm, a leg, a head, and so on and so forth. So each civil servant plays or plays a forms a, a key part of that body of the, the, the whole body so this is what by having the bigger picture is actually seeing how as a as an employee how does my role fit in within into the larger picture so if i'm working in finance or being an accountant within the civil service so my role plays a key role because a if i'm working with you know managing finances and so on and so forth it contributes to the wider whole so i may not be the one shaping policies or developing policies however what i do place is equally important to the civil service as a body delivering on its objective. So this is what they look for, that people who demonstrate the ability to see the bigger picture. Secondly, it's changing and improving. So what the civil service means by this is people who are effective in this area are people who take initiative, are innovative and seek out opportunities to create effective change. For all staff, it is about learning from what has worked as well as what has not worked being open to change and improvement and working in a smarter, more focused way. So it's about looking at people's ability to be able to, to learn, and also ability to be able to look at ways to improve what has been done previously or what might have worked or and see how it can work better. And so it's about being innovative and using initiatives. So this is what, again, when, in, when assessing candidates through things like the situational judgment test, we're looking at how people demonstrate these as well as the other stages. So the next one is making effective decisions. What the civil service mean by effective decision in, in this area is, is about using sound judgment, evidence and knowledge to arrive at an accurate expert and professional decisions and advice. So for all staff, it's about being careful and thoughtful about the use and protection of government and public information to ensure it is handled securely with care. Okay, why this is crucial is, as a civil servant, as I mentioned earlier, every decision has to be based on evidence, has to be based on objective, which is one of the civil service core values, as opposed to making decisions based on personal opinion. Again, it's about thinking about the, the potential impact of making a decision based on, potential, uh, based on personal opinion and not based on evidence, how that could have a, a grave impact on millions of people, not just in the UK, but also globally. So this is why they assess and test candidates to show how they demonstrate, how they fare against making decisions based on um, evidence as opposed to a subjective view. 
So that's the first three, which falls under set of strategic uh, setting directions or setting strategic directions. And I'm now going to look at engaging people. So the first of the engaging people category is leading and communicating. What the civil service mean by leading and communicating is about showing pride and passion for public service, communicating purpose and direction with clarity, integrity, and enthusiasm. It's about championing difference and external experience and supporting principles of fairness of opportunity for all. It's about being visible, establishing a strong direction and persuasive future vision, managing and engaging with people in a straight, straightforward, truthful, and candid way. Followed by that is the collaborating and partnering. So people who are skilled in this area are known as team players. At all levels, it requires working collaboratively, sharing information appropriately, and building supportive, trusting, and professional relationships with colleagues and the wide range of people within and outside the civil service, whilst having the confidence to challenge assumptions. Again, this examples of how this could be demonstrated is, you know, having experience working. So for yourself, uh, Josh, you might have had an experience working in a group, uh, working in a group task at university. So again, there's already evidence of how you can actually, how you may have demonstrated this within your normal day-to-day -day lives or before you started university. So again, it's about looking at how the assessor actually how can work effectively within a team. And followed by that is building capabilities for all. Again, with this particular competency, it's important to understand what the civil service mean by building capability for all. Because this word might mean something totally different. For example, I assumed, my, before understanding what this means, I assumed that building capability for all is about looking at how I, make, how I would make a difference in the wider society or my local community. However, what the civil service means by building capability for all is having a strong focus on continuous learning for oneself, others, and the organization. It's about being open to learning, about keeping one's own knowledge and skill set current and evolving. So it's looking at, you know, how do you enhance your, your knowledge? For example, if you're interested in the civil service, you know, do you, what, do you read particular publications about the civil service to understand uh, what they do or understand, you know, what's happening currently? You know, one of the latest topic in the news at the moment is Brexit. So, you know, how often do you keep updated with, with, uh, with Brexit and what's in the news? So that's, that's, uh, this, is how, this is what they mean by how you build your capability for yourself as well as for others. Because in, in enhancing your own personal knowledge, not only would it benefit your team, but also benefit the wider organization because you will be making an informed decision based on what's happening externally. So that's building, that's the, so we've gone through setting direction, engaging people. And now we're going to look at the final option, which is delivering results. So the first one of this is managing a quality service. So what the civil service means by managing a quality service is about valuing and modeling professional excellence and expertise to deliver our service objectives, taking account of diverse customer needs and requirements. So people who are effective in this area, uh, they plan, organize and manage their time and activities to deliver a high quality, secure, reliable and efficient service, applying program projects and risk management approaches to support service delivery. In essence, what this is saying is, on a day-to-day -day basis, how do you ensure that you deliver a quality service, uh, man you know, manage your, deliver your objectives and make sure you maintain quality, especially when things are high pressured or time sensitive. So it's asking, okay, what do you use? Do you use particular tools? Do you use tools like such as Excel spreadsheets or any project management tools? So this is what they're really asking for to see how people manage, ensure that they deliver services or projects, uh, you know, on time and within deadline and meeting the required objectives. Next, that's delivering at pace. Um, again, effectiveness in this area means focusing on delivering timely performance with energy and taking responsibility and accountability for quality outcomes. It's about working to agreed goals and activities and dealing with challenges in a responsive and constructive way. So, and last but not least is achieving commercial outcomes. So achieving commercial outcomes, I thought uh, achieving commercial outcomes in this area means it's about maintaining an economic long-term focus in all activities, i.e. it's about having a commercial, financial and sustainable mindset to ensure that all activities and services are delivered are delivering added value and working to stimulate economic growth. 
So it's looking at how, with what you do, how does that, you know, what's the longer term impact? So for example, if you were asked to create a policy to build a playground, you know, could that playground be used for other services? Could it be used to, in most parks these days, as well as the park, the basic function of a park being for people to relax and, and go for a walk, some parks have outdoor um, fitness or outdoor gyms. So this is how you can use one uh, facility for multiple purposes because it meets the long-term benefits are it improves the health of people within the area. There's a reduction on, uh, on um, spending on NHS, for example, which saves money, also improves health and people's well-being and long-term uh, sustainability. So it's like looking at that's a, an example of how policies can actually be shaped and implemented in a way that not just meets one objective but multiple objectives. So it's like looking, it's looking at people who demonstrate these sorts of traits. And I think there is also one more which we haven't gone through, which is known as delivering value for money. Again, this is about, it involves um, the efficient and effective economic use of taxpayers' money in delivering of public service. It means seeking out and implementing solutions which achieve the best mix of quality and effectiveness for the least outlay, i.e. the least expenses. Now, this is all the competencies. Again, it's quite, and it, I had to spend a lot of time um, on that before we move on because this is perhaps the most important aspect um, of the application process before even looking at the application itself. Understanding this is so vital and key uh, before proceeding. Any question on that before we leave? Actually, what I'll suggest is to maybe hold on, hold, hold, hold the questions till uh, later on, on competencies. So the next stage is the situation judgment test. This is gonna be quick. So, so what is it? What, how, what, um, what are the civil services looking for in particular around the situation of judgment test? So what it is, is a set of questions where you're asked to decide on the best course of action given some work-based scenario. So you set a scenario or several scenarios and ask you to actually decide what you think would be the best way to go about it. And this is known as, usually known as a, a, a most effective and a least effective option. Meaning you have a list of four options, however, Two of those, one is most effective and one is least effective depending on the scenario. And again, this particular test, so these the, the, the competencies that have been assessed in this area is decision making. So making effective decision, as well as other competency areas. Well, the key one to note for the situation judgment test is decision making. And how this works, again, you'll be scored um one mark for getting the answer correctly and half a mark if you get an answer but it's not the most effective answer and then there is no mark awarded if it's neither the most effective or least effective answer the tips normally is to try and practice questions on the fast stream website which you'll get a chance to do shortly and carefully read the scenario before giving an answer as well as consider what would be the best possible response before choosing one and use the civil service competencies as criteria for guiding responses. The questionnaire is untimed and usually lasts about 30 minutes. And once one thing that's crucial is, although the deadline is the 12 p.m. Thursday the 15th of November, so however, as long as you start your test before 12 p.m. on Thursday, you have up to five days to complete the situational judgment test. And in addition to that, you'll be also given a behavioral test. Again, this asks this uh, a range of questions that rate against the civil service competencies. So it's about rating yourself against the competencies. Uh, again, this assesses on all competency areas. And with this, the tips are to think about your own personal qualities in relation to the competency areas, respond honestly in terms of your preferred style of working when you are and when you're at your best. And the questionnaire is untimed. Again, but don't spend too long on any one question. And similar to the situation judgment test, about 30 minutes uh, to complete it. So I'm gonna go, so this is the deadline, about uh, the deadline for this uh, early diversity internship program. However, I'm just gonna go quickly through what the early diversity internship program is. It's a one week uh, internship program um, where that gives interested candidates an opportunity to really you know, just to engage, uh, to, to, to shadow a fast streamer and gain a real insight into the role of a fast streamer. 
And within this week, you'll be engaged in a series of stimulating corporate networking and social events, and also attend an assessment survival workshop, giving you all you need to know about applying for the graduate vacancies for when you do graduate from university and if you decide to go on to work within the civil service. And you'll also be allocated with a fast stream body who will act as a mentor during that week. Uh, to share the insights, to share what it's like for them to work in the civil service, and to get more of a personal touch and feel uh, from being a civil servant. And if within that week, also will be a chance to attend an opening and closing reception attended by high profile speakers, such as the civil service diversity champions and inspirational external figures. This is where this is attended by everyone who has been accepted onto the early uh, into the EDIP program, as well as uh, so into the EDIP program, so transport so network and build relationship with students from across different universities. So this program, the, this usually uh, EDIP usually takes place in the takes place in the in April for uh, five days, five working days, and it's open to candidates from uh, so all first year stu undergraduate students from one or more of the following backgrounds, or from a black, Asian, minority, ethnic background, or from a socially or economically disadvantaged background, or students that consider themselves to have a disability, which could also include a physical disability or a mental disability. So this is all, as I said, it's not a paid role. However, all expenses are covered for uh, during that week and it's London based only. So it's only based in London. So that's a bit about the Early Diversity Intention Program. And I'm now going to take any, take questions before we go on to practice the test. So any, I know there's two questions already. Okay, so no questions currently. Or just, do you have any questions at the moment? If not, we will start with the test and then save questions for after the test. Excellent. Okay, so what I would suggest, just I'm going to send you a a link, and I'm now I'm going to send you a link which has which will give you access to to the practice access to the practice test. So if you bear with me. Oh, ignore that. So if you click on that link, it should take you to the practice test and let me know if it's working. Okay, let me try again. What about this link? Okay, so if you follow the instruction that says, as you come across where it says practice questions for the situation of judgment questionnaire. If you click on that, it should take you to 
a page which will look like this one I'm about to show you. It should take it to a page that looks like that says open access preview situation and judgment questionnaire. So it says this is just a preview of the types of question you will be faced with during the situation judgment test. In total, there are five questions in this process in this in this open access preview test. Each question takes the form of a scenario one might face whilst working in the role of a fast streamer. Each scenario is followed by a set of four separate of separate four response options. For each scenario, you are required to select the option which is the most effective response and the option which is the least effective response. The most and least effective responses have been determined by subject matter experts who are familiar with the types of scenarios fast streamers may face in the role. In the root assessment, you'll be presented with 25 scenarios which are untimed. Okay, so getting started, the preview test consists of five scenarios and should take about, should take about five minutes to complete. In this preview test, you'll be asked to select the most effective and least effective responses. You will then receive feedback on the most and least effective options, responses which have been determined by subject matters. Remember, there are five scenarios with four response options each. Please select one most effective response and one least effective response. When making your selection, think about how you would behave at work if faced with a similar situation. The test is not timed. So when selecting a response, most options, you can use your mouse to select the chosen option. Essentially, you can use the tab and arrow keys on your keyboard to choose which statement you wish to respond to by using the A, B, C, or D keys, then selecting L or M when ranking buttons are highlighted. Click the next button below to begin test. Okay, so this is what, this is an example question. So number one, I'm gonna quickly just explain how this works before I give it a, a for free you get opportunity to, to, to do one yourself, Josh. Um, so the question is, your line manager has asked you to provide a summary of a 20 page European Commission policy document. She needs this, pay, this, she needs this to prepare for an important meeting that is happening in the near future and does not have time to read the whole report. However, the document is not well written and is presented in an order that you feel is not very logical, although it has been agreed at senior level. What should you do? So again, you notice there are four responses that you could choose. And out of these four responses, one is most effective and one is least effective. Just explain what that means quickly. So most meaning that all options are potentially effective. However, one of them is most effective and one is least effective. And so this is where you get scored on, or you get one mark for getting, a mark each for getting them correctly. So with this, what you want to bear in mind, so going back to what we said about making effective decisions at the beginning, so using evidence, you know, using things based on evidence, as opposed to using your own opinion. So this is something that you want to, this is what in essence this is testing you against in terms of making, being able to make an effective decision. So a few things to notice, which you might have already picked up on already are, you know, the line managers are so the task is even asked to, to provide a summary document, just a summary document. And they so said this is needs to be prepared for an important meeting. So again, understanding the nature of what this is needed for is an important meeting that is happening in the near future. There's no data assigned to it and does not have the time to read the whole report. So the reason why the managers asked for provide a summary is because they don't have the time to produce to read the whole report. So this some this is crucial. This is the exact ask that they've asked for and why they've also asked for that. However, the document is not well written and it's presented in order that you feel is not very logical. This is the curveball. It says, although it has been agreed at a senior level, so what should you do? Normally, people would respond to this question by thinking, oh, you know, I could, you know create the summary, uh, arrange a meeting with the line manager to raise concerns about the structure of the document before starting the work, or rewrite the document before creating the summary so that it's easier to understand if others pick it up in the future. In a way, that I can, that, that makes sense. You probably agree with, agree as, as well that why that would make logical sense. However, what that does is it goes against what that was being asked or and why the document, why the manager, line manager has, has asked for a summary document. And also it's been agreed at a senior level and there is no 
as as the question, there is no evidence or to know why it's been agreed in that why it's been written in that format. So changing this document or choosing the option to say rewrite the document before creating the summary would perhaps actually go against everything that's been set in the question in itself. So that in a way gives a clue that is not effective. What well, the question is, is it the least effective option? Then we're going to the next one. So option B is write the summary of the document, but change the order so that it follows an easier format for your line manager. Again, in a way, this is, it says write the document, but change the order. So in a way you're writing a summary, but changing the order. So it follows an easier format for your line manager. The question is, yeah, you can see why that would make sense, but it changing the order goes against the bit where it says the report has been agreed at a senior level. So you don't know why it was formatted in, the, in that way, whether even it, may, it might not make sense to you, but you don't know why it's been formatted in a certain way. So the next option is create the summary in the existing order, ensuring it is clearly written. There was probably a reason for why it was presented in this way. So if you compare both B and C, so B tells you that it's effective, but if you compare B to A, you see that B is probably more effective than A. So B wouldn't be the least effective option. Or if you compare B and C together, C seems to follow in the order that how the document has been set. So it says, create the summary in existing order, ensure it is clearly written so that it would make sense to the manager. And also there was probably a reason why it was presented in this way. So again, you think actually, you know what, C is more effective than B and definitely more effective than A. So let's compare C to D. So D says, arrange a meeting with your line manager to raise your concerns about the structure of the document before starting the work. Again, arranging a meeting makes sense. However, the thing is the line manager may not have the time to actually meet in person as it says that, you know, and uh, as it already says on it that the line manager does not have time to read through the whole document. So there's already, already short of time. So again, this is effective, but perhaps if you compare C and D together, you'll see that C is most effective. And if you compare D and A together, you see that D is also more effective than A. So in a way, this gives the clue of what the most least effective options will be. So in this case, C will be the most effective option and A will be the least effective option in comparison to the all other, all uh, three other options, uh, two other options. So this gives you a clue, just as far as I go for it, just to give you sort of the logical reasoning behind how, what to bear in mind when responding to the question. So A, understand the question, what's being asked, be clear on it, and then choose from the options what is the that most effective based on what's been asked and the least effective also based on what's been asked. So I hope that gives a bit of a clarity and understanding actually how to tackle the question. So with that said, um, you click on C and C as the most effective and A as the least effective, and then move on to the next option to try question two. So I'm now going to leave you to practice in question two and, and the rest of the questions, and then we will go through the discuss the answers um, shortly. So if you make a note of the answers that you've come up with um, and also then we have to discuss it afterwards. So I'm going to give you about four minutes just to do, so it's now 4.50, so 4.50, so I've come back at 4.55 um, to go through the answers and then go through any questions after that.
Okay, welcome back. Um, so what I'm not going to do is just to go through any, just go through your answers. If I can ask you to type up your, to share your answers with me for uh, questions two, three, four, and five, and so what you chose is the most effective and least effective, and then we'll be able to then go through and discuss them. Uh, spend the next five minutes to discuss and then go through any questions that you may have. We can do it live if your mic, did you just say, is your mic working? We can do it live that way. That's absolutely fine. Okay, I'll give you, uh, give you a few more uh, minutes just to go through that. Be back shortly.
Hi, just just checking to see if you are if you if you are good to go, or is there a require additional time? I just see you there. Hi, okay, um, so I did see your message. Are you good to go with your answers? And should I invite you so we can have a live conversation? Hi Josh, can you hear me? Okay, no worries. So what were your answers? Well, if you give me a phone number, I can give you a ring and we can discuss it over the phone. If you provide me with a contact number to reach you on, uh, we're able to give you a call on there or so that we can discuss it over the phone. Hi, Josh, are you there? Okay. Okay, what are your answers? Could you give me what your, let me know what your answers are. I'll just see if you have any questions about um, the test or the presentation and that way we able to respond. So have about, give another 10, so quarter past five to go through any questions that you may have. What did you have as the most effective and least effective or number two?
So, so most effective for number two was you chose D as the most effective and least effective as you chose B for least effective. Okay, it's gonna go through that again. Uh, spare with me one moment. And what's for number three? What did you choose for number three? Okay, number three, um, most effective is B and least effective is A. You chose B for most effective, least effective is A. Okay, uh, what about number four? So you can let me number four and five, then we can go through them individually. So what we'll do in the meantime, we'll go through number two. So question two, the most effective, the correct answer for question two is B. B is the most effective and D is the least effective. I'm going to explain why that is. So it's gonna read through the question again. So the question is, you are responsible for organizing and coordinating the regular meetings of a cross-governmental group working on public health. Unfortunately, why director level attendance is requested. Many directors have started to delegate their attendance and you are concerned that the group is losing momentum and influence. What should you do? So the reason why C is the most effective is because, says before each meeting, send the directors a simple but engaging email with a list of issues to be discussed in the form of unanswered question. Sorry, the correct answer is B. B is the most effective, my apologies. I think I gave you the wrong information. So B is the most effective for number two and D is the least effective for number two. So the reason why B is the most effective says, where possible, speak to each of the directors prior to the main meeting to discuss, to discuss the issues of importance to them on the agenda so that they see the benefit. The reason why this is most effective compared to the others is by speaking to each director, you're able to explain to them, you know, the main points of the meeting to this, and why they, which I don't understand why their presence is needed and also the importance of the agenda so that they see the benefit for them to be there. Emailing them is effective, but the challenge with that is it may take time. They may not see the email straight away. It may take a while. And so that's why, although A might be effective, it's not the most effective. It's the same is with C. So before each meeting, send a direct to a simple but engaging email with a list of issues to be discussed in the form of unanswered, unanswered questions. Again, that's effective, but compared to B, it's not the most effective. Whereas if you, with option D, the reason why D is the least effective is that, say, send an email reminder of the meeting date and time before each meeting to ensure that it remains at the forefront of their mind. If you compare that to option A and C, is it doesn't actually help them to, you know, that option doesn't actually help them to understand the importance of the meeting and actually also why their presence is needed. It doesn't actually do any of that. Just getting them to, you know, to remind them to be at the forefront of, for them to be at the forefront of their, uh, of, of, um, of their mind, may not necessarily actually have to achieve the goal, which was, you know, to ensure that the directors attend the meeting. So this is why D would be the least effective or is the least effective and why B compared to A and C is the most effective. So that's for question two. So question three, the most effective is A and the least effective is C. 
Um, so the reason why A is the most effective for question three, which I'm going to go on to next, is that, so if you go back to the question, so again, so you're working on an audit equipment in your department, you have received feedback that people are getting fed up with the administrator's burden of tasks that you require them to complete so far as part of the audit. You are aware that you will need to gather all the information frequently over the next few months. What should you do? Again, with this option, it is also, the reason why A is most effective is, if you spend some time gathering opinions and ideas so that you can make the audit process as simple and efficient as possible for those who need to provide the information. So by spending some time gathering opinions and ideas so that you can make the order process as simple as efficient as possible for those who need to improve the information would help, would actually have to address some of the uh, frustration that's been expressed and people being fed up. Whereas if you compare A to B, B says create a flyer clearly laying out the dates and requirements of the audit and offering your support to help gather the data to reduce the burden on individuals. Yes, why there's a good there's a attempt there to reduce the burden. Creating the flyer doesn't actually help to understand what people's burdens are. Whereas if you compare that to A, A says gather, gather opinions and ideas so that you can make an audit process as simple as possible. So with this, you're getting people's opinion and understand why they're frustrated and how to also improve it better, improve it for them. And whereas C, e, C says apologize to those affected and say you recognize their burden, suggesting that ahead of the next audit, you will spend time exploring ways to reduce this burden. Again, you can see why that's list effect, why that's not effective at all, because it doesn't actually solve the problem and they've got to wait till the next time. And whereas D say send out calendar reminders for when the audit is scheduled so that the requests for information are expected and can be planned for by individuals. Again, that's effective. Well, if you compare it to option A, D isn't the most effective. So it's effective, but it's not the most effective. So the option, so this is why A and A is the most effective and why C is the least effective. So just going into the last, so I'm just gonna do the question four and then we'll go through, have, have some time for questions and answers. So question four, the most effective is C and the least effective is B. So question four, you've got the most least effective correct, which is good, well done on that. And so it says you have been invited to the policy meeting with other fast streamers and senior colleagues. Prior to the meeting, you have done some research to help prepare for it. However, you soon find you are struggling to follow the conversation during the meeting as various acronyms are being used, which you are not familiar with. What should you do? So again, looking at, so with C being, C being the most effective, so if you compare that, so it says, ask a clarification question as soon as possible. If questions are positively received, continue to ask questions during the meeting, which makes sense. Uh, again, people may feel like, but they don't really want to ask questions because you don't want to seem like, you know, you're bothering people or seem as if you don't know. However, not knowing and then going based on your own opinion has, again, going back to effective decision-making could have potential consequences. However, gaining clarity by just asking. And it also, if they look at the way they suggest is to ask, so look, if it's being positively received, continue to ask questions during the meeting because that, you know, shows that you're, being mindful, but also showing that you're going there, going, leaving that meeting with clarity and you're also demonstrating your ability and willingness to learn and building capability for yourself. And the reason, so if you compare to A, so A says, wait until the end of the meeting and speak with other colleagues who were present to get clarification on the acronyms. That's effective, but again, you may miss out on important parts of that meeting by not understanding the acronyms. And if you look at B, B says throughout the meeting, ask questions immediately after an acronym arises so that you can easily follow what has been said and improve your understanding. Why that is good, but asking immediately after each acronym disrupts the flow of what someone's actually saying. Whereas option C says, if questions are positively received, continue to ask questions during the meeting. And it also says, ask a clarification, clarification question as soon as possible which may be after someone has gone through, finished explaining their points. But asking immediately after may cause disruption and actually impact on the meeting. Whereas with D, D says record the acronyms you do not understand and then independently take the time to research what they mean. 
that's another that's effective because you can go back to do your personal research later on it's effective but again it's not there and then so you could miss out potential key details during the meeting and so if you go back to a a again you're still learning the acronyms by asking colleagues after the meeting but you miss out on actually understanding those things during the meeting which will also impact on uh, you know getting the most out of the meeting so this is why c is the most effective and why a uh, why b is the least effective was B says ask immediately, which disrupts the meeting, whereas C says ask clarification question as soon as possible. And if it's been positively received, continue to ask questions during the meeting. So I hope this gives a bit of clarity as to, so well done on getting B correct for the least effective. I hope that gives an, a, a, a sort of overview of how to address the questions moving forward. So we're now gonna have some time for some Q&A. Um, so I was gonna end